Okay, I'll get started. Uh, welcome back, everyone. For those who missed the uh, first session on Monday, I am Joe Newhouse, Chair of the ITA. I want to welcome you to the second session of ITA's four-part se seminar, Focus on the Draft Code of Conduct for adjudicators, adjudicators in Investor State Arb Settlement. Our first session on Monday addressed issue conflicts and the code's provisions in Article 5, particularly Article 5.2d, calling for potential arbitrators in investor state disputes to disclose all publications and all relevant speeches. We heard a really excellent discussion that addressed the range of prior statements and decisions that can be raised by the term issue conflicts and some of the background law and practice in the area. Our panelists also discussed how you measure whether a prior writing raises a conflict, whether disclosure requirements such as those in the draft code might have a chilling effect on potential arbitrators or provide avenues for bad faith challenges. And they also discussed some questions raised by the precise, precise drafting of the code. It was a great discussion and I'm looking forward to more today. For those of you who missed it, the full panel was recorded and will be publicly posted. We'll send a link to the, all those who registered for any of the sessions. Today's, today's focus is on the double hatting problem, where arbitrators also sit as counsel or in other roles in arbitration. As a reminder, on Thursday, the topic will be repeat appointments by a party or counsel of the same arbitrator. And we'll finish up with on Friday, with questions of implementation and enforcement of the draft code. I won't repeat my uh, introductions of Chiara Giorgetti and Tom Sicora, our moderators and the organizers of the whole week's events. I will, however, say again how proud ITA is of this program and of the world-class faculty who are participating. And I'll repeat our thanks to Chiara and Tom for putting it all together. Chiara or Tom, take it away. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Sikora. I am the Senior Vice Chair of the ITA, and I have the distinct pleasure of being able to introduce our very distinguished panel today. Uh, and I'll do that alphabetically. Let me start with Professor Andrea Bjorklund. She is the Associate Dean, as well as a full professor and the Eve Fortier Chair in International Arbitration and International Commercial Law at McGill University Faculty of Law. She's an advisor to the American Law Institute's project on restating the US law of international commercial arbitration, as well as a member of the advisory board of the Investment Treaty Forum of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. Before entering the academy, she was an attorney advisor on the NAFTA arbitration team in the office of the U.S. legal advisor at the U.S. Department of State. Professor Bjorklund has a JD from Yale Law School, a Master in Arts and French Studies from NYU, and a BA with high honors in history uh, and French from the University of Nebraska. Next, moving on, um, Ms. Anna Joubampaet is Secretary of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law and Director of the International Trade Law Division of the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs since November 2017. Prior to her appointment, uh, Mrs. Joubon Brett was a practicing attorney at law of the Paris Bar. She specialized in international investment law and investment dispute resolution. She focused on serving as counsel arbitrator, mediator, and conciliator in international investment disputes. She served as arbitrator in many ICSID, UNCITRAL, and ICC disputes. Prior to 2011 and for 15 years, Anna was the senior legal advisor for the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD. She has lectured on international investment law in various universities and institutes all over the world, she holds a postgraduate degree in private international law from University of Paris, Panthéon, Sorbonne, a master's degree in international economic law from University of Paris, and a bachelor's degree in political science from Institut d'études politiques, and a bachelor's degree uh, of arts in private law from Université Jean Moulin. Next, Meg Kinnear. Uh, Ms. Kinnear is vice president 
of the World Bank Group and Secretary General of the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. Ms. Kinnear was formerly the Senior General Counsel and, and Director General of the Trade Law Bureau of Canada. In November 2002, she was also named Chair of the Negotiating Group on Dispute Settlement for the Free Trade of the Americas Agreement. Um, from October 96 to April 99, Ms. Kinnear was Executive Assistant to the Deputy Minister of Justice of Canada. And prior to that, she was counsel at the Civil Litigation Section of the Canadian Department of Justice. She's called to the Bar of Ontario, the Bar of the District of Columbia, and she has received a Bachelor's of Arts from Queen's University, a Bachelor of Laws from McGill, and a Master of Laws from the University of Virginia, Wahoo. Uh, Mr. Bart Legum is a partner in the Paris office and global co-chair for litigation and dispute resolution at Dentons, the world's largest legal practice. Earlier in his career, he served in the U.S. Department of State as lead counsel for the U.S. government in the early investment arbitrations under the NAFTA agreement. Ms. Lucinda Lowe is a partner of Steptoe and Johnson LLP based in its Washington DC office. She serves on the firm's executive committee, co-chairs the firm's compliance, investigations, trade and enforcement department, and oversees strategy for the firm's international offices and initiatives. Her practice includes arbitration, particularly of investor state disputes, as well as international regulatory compliance, investigation and enforcement matters especially involving fraud, corruption, business, human rights, and other compliance issues affecting multinational businesses. Ms. Lowe served as president of the American Society of International Law for 20, from 2016 to 2018, and was the first woman to chair the ABA section of international law. She's a member of the U.S. Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on Public International Law and serves on the ICSID panel of conciliators and the ICSID panel of arbitrators. She currently serves on several arbitral tribunals, primarily as president and chairs an annulment committee. She has lived in Brazil and therefore works in Portuguese, Spanish, and French, as well as English. So Ms. Sylvie Tabe is general counsel at Canada's Trade Law Bureau, where she is responsible for providing trade law advice and litigating international trade and investment cases on behalf of the government of Canada. She has extensive experience in negotiating in international trade and investment agreements, including bilateral investment treaty with China, the Canada-EU trade agreement, where Sylvie was lead counsel for the government of Canada. She has also litigated WTO cases on behalf of Canada and successfully led Canada's defense in numerous NAFTA Chapter 11 cases and the recent global telecom uh, holdings case under the Canada-Egypt BIT. She's Canada's representative for UNCITRAL Working Group 3 on Investor State Dispute Settlement Reform. Sylvie was called to the Quebec Bar in 1994. She's fluent in French and English, has a good knowledge of Spanish, and currently lives in Tokyo. So those are our distinguished panel members. Uh, and over to you, Chiara. Thank you very much, uh, Tom and, and Joe, for the introduction. My name is Chiara Giorgetti, and I'm a professor of law at Richmond Law School and the chair of the Academic Council of the ITA. Um, while as scholarly residents at, at ICSID Secretariat last year, I had the opportunity to work uh, closely on the drafting of the code, which I consider a fundamental development uh, of, uh, of the SDS reform. As mentioned by Joe uh, before, in the first webinar of the series, we addressed um, issue conflict. And today we address another thorny and fundamental issue that has raised concern uh, when discussing ISDS reform and many see it as uh, intrinsically linked to issue conflict also as a matter uh, touching on the independence and impartiality of arbitrator and possibly conflict uh, of interest of arbitrators. So the issue is double heading and the double heading is considered in article 6 of the draft code. Before giving the floor to our panelists I'd like to offer some short introduction on why double heading can be seen as problematic and what are the issues that arise when trying to address uh, this issue in a code of conduct. 
First, um, I would like to note um, that Article 6 is titled Limit on Multiple Roles. And this is because the very question of the definition of double heading is not very clear. In other words, which hats matter? Um, for sure, I think there's an agreement that the, uh, one cannot wear the same counsel and adjudicator hat. Uh, but what about the role of experts, of witnesses, members of the secretariat, other form agents or other kind of advisors? Uh, a link to this is the issue of the scope. Um, and this is the issue for the scope that is also uh, valid for counsel and adjudicator. Um, is double heading problematic only for cases and proceeding under the same treaty for all ISDS cases or maybe even for all international cases? There might be some overlapping in cases for the International Court of Justice, for example, or in general in international public law issues. Um, and the second question that arises from them is really how to address this issue. Should we consider a total ban on double hatting, uh, whatever the definition that we agree is, um, which is the posture that has been taken by CETA, the Canada European Union uh, Trade Agreement, or should it be limited? And if it is limited, on what ground? Should it be limited temporally or on a treaty base? There are some other examples. So for example, the CPTPP has includes a temporal and treaty-based prohibition. The Dutch model BIT also introduces a temporal restriction in Article 20 provides for a restriction of five years in investment arbitration under the same treaty or in any other international agreement. And the practice direction of the ICJ also includes a temporal. Um, a temporal limitation. So now these are some of the issues that I think arise uh, when we think about uh, double heading um, and to learn more in the specific context of the draft code. Um, the first round of contribution by today panelists will, look, will first focus on the definition of double heading and what and when double heading can become uh, problematic. Uh, our first speaker is as Nat Kinnear and she will explain, talk a, lot, a little more about the text um, of, uh, of the draft code. Thank you very much, Meg. Thank you, Kiara. Uh, I would like to just address this basic structure of Article 6 as context for the discussion that's coming up. As you will have seen, it's a very short article, but it contains a lot of square brackets. And of course, those square brackets indicate different options that might be selected by the delegates and that delegates are going to have to discuss. I should note that not just those options are potential, certainly delegates are free to bring up other options, but those were the ones that were thought to be the most logical ones that needed discussion. I wanted to make five discrete points about the structure of the uh, Article 6 on multiple roles. And again, first of all, a note on the title, Limit on Multiple Roles. Among the reasons that we decided to use this title was that the phrase double hatting, uh, although we all, including myself, use it as shorthand for the situation we're trying to discuss, double hatting is not a legal term of art and it is taken on a fairly negative connotation. And I think it really gets in the way of having the kind of discussion you ought to have, which is what is the problem that we're trying to fix? what is the impact of any prescription that we come up with to address it, and what's the best option when you take into account cost benefit. I assume most of us would agree that the concern here is a situation where one arbitrator plays more than one role, and the result of the multiple roles is that that arbitrator cannot be seen as independent or impartial. Uh, obviously, this raises a side debate about whether the question is properly, do the multiple roles create an actual conflict, or is it sufficient that they create an apprehension or a perception of conflict? And if it is that, the, ap ap the uh, perception of conflict, whose perception? Is it a subjective perception of one of the parties, or is it an objective perception that a reasonable third party might have? And of course, the reasonable perception is what case law has required to date. The second point is about that first set of square brackets, and it gives the choice essentially between an outright prohibition on multiple roles or disclosure of the multiple roles. Now, outright prohibition, I think in some ways is appealing. 
because it is a bright line rule and it's easy to apply. However, there may well be a number of unintended consequences if you choose that kind of a bright line rule. Well, we've heard a number of concerns in comments and uh, in a number of articles. And among them are raised, first of all, the constraint on freedom of choice, which of course is one of the key features of arbitration. Number two is the impact on replenishment of what you might call first time arbitrators. In other words, most people who would like to be arbitrators have to start with their first case, but they cannot afford to give up all other sources of income. And it's very uncertain whether they will get a second, third and fourth case. So would this limit on multiple roles constrain that replenishment of the arbitral pool? A similar argument is made with respect to constraint on more diverse candidates in the arbitral pool, because I think it's fair to say that we are seeing more diversity in the first timers and the new arbitrators that are coming to the profession. Some people have suggested that that kind of a problem could be solved with a transition period. For example, something like you wouldn't have the limit on multiple roles in your first five years. But that in and of itself, I think, is difficult. If we think there truly is a conflict of interest, it's hard to say it's okay to be conflicted for your first five years. So the solutions are obviously not very easy. Uh, the other situation uh, is the effect of a ban on what you might say the profile of the arbitral pool. Will it de facto cut out one of the main sources of expertise, which are people who have practiced, and leave you with a pool, for example, of all retired people or all academics or that kind of a different profile? And if so, is that a problem? And that has also been raised by a number of people. Now, the alternate to prohibition, of course, is disclosure. And disclosure gives the parties themselves the option of deciding whether the multiple roles cause a bona fide concern about impartiality. And in some cases, that arbitrator might recuse themselves, or in other cases, the parties might have to go to a challenge motion. And again, the downside of that is the cost and the delay of having to challenge uh, an arbitrator. So that's the second point. My third point uh, relates to the actual definition of the overlapping rules. And frankly, it is extremely difficult to define, uh, apart from what perhaps is the more obvious situation, the arbitrator, adjudicator, uh, arbitrator council overlap. But beyond that, there are a lot of discussions that have been raised. Um, and there are those who would say that in fact, the overlap of uh, advocate and adjudicator perhaps is not or should not be the most difficult one because an advocate is advocating a position. It doesn't mean that that is what they truly believe or that they think it is the strongest position. They are advocating the strongest position on behalf of their client. So that's one of the considerations. Another overlap situation that I think is probably as difficult is the question of an expert and in particular, an expert witness on law which we see relatively often in investor state. And presumably that expert witness on law is giving a position that they uh, sincerely believe. And therefore you might be able to say, how can they then become an arbitrator and have an open mind? That's one of the other roles that's listed here. The provision also lists judge, agent, or any other relevant role. And we recognize that word relevant while it allows some flexibility may be fairly broad and it perhaps might be uh, appropriate to limit it to a relevant role in investor state. Although you can see situations perhaps in other international litigation that might factually present a conflict. So that's the idea of what are the roles that are overlapping that would be of concern. The fourth question is the one of temporal limits. And what article six suggests is that the roles are played simultaneously. But in brackets, it does note the option of played within X years. In other words, again, a hard number of how many years. And that would allow you to go back, for example, a year, two years, whatever is required, and catch the situation of when a role was very recently played. Um, again, defining the time is not easy. We've heard one year, five years, 10 years. 
as always, having that kind of absolute number is helpful in terms of easy to apply, but just naturally is going to be a little bit arbitrary uh, because you have that's the vir that's the virtue, but also the devil in in that detail. The fifth question and the last one that I wanted to bring up is the whole question of what kind of overlap is problematic. And you will see that the code notes that it is first and foremost where you have the same parties. But the question is, is that enough? Or should there also be the same parties plus, for example, the same facts or the same treaty? Um, and you'll note that the proposal here is that these are cumulative. So you have have to think about all of them together and it might be for example that it's the same parties and same treaty or same parties and same facts so there are a lot of moving pieces in this last stanza of the uh, article and that again is for delegates to figure out when do we think the overlap is sufficient to be one that causes concern so that hopefully will start the discussion and i will leave it to my colleagues to uh resolve all of these questions that come up with the issue of multiple roles. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mac, for setting us off. And apologies for sharing the wrong screen at the beginning uh, of your talk. I hope that in my second iteration um, that you could all see the article, Article 6, that Mac was discussing. This also reminds me the, the opportunity um, um, of, uh, we have an opportunity to, uh, to ask questions for the audience. We would very much welcome uh, your questions. We will have about 15 minutes, hopefully, at the end. Uh, and please use the Q&A function uh, that is open now to ask uh, questions. Um, Sylvie, can I uh, maybe ask you if you would like to talk a little bit about the views of states and share your, um, your experience and your take on, um, on the provision? Thank you. Sylvie, you are mute. Apologies. Um, let me start by thanking you, Chiara and Tom and uh, the ITA uh, for putting together this really excellent uh, set of uh, uh, webinars. And uh, I think this is a, a really important issue uh, and uh, very topical and, and very timely that we have uh, this discussion, obviously. Um, I think Meg has very nicely set out the contours of uh, the discussion. So um, maybe I can start by picking up on uh, the issue of what is the problem we're trying to address and maybe come back a little bit later to some of the solutions uh, and some of the issues Meg, Meg raised with respect to scope and temporal limitations uh, and some of the problems that arise with the solution. So uh, first of all, everybody agrees, we have to identify the problems. Uh, and I think also it's true to say that everyone agrees that impartiality and independence are key to ensuring due process, a fair hearing, and really the legitimacy or essential to the legitimacy of the investor state dispute settlement process. By and large, everyone also agrees that there's a per perception problem uh, in this respect that results from ad hoc arbitration, and in particular, what is referred to as double hatting. Now, is that a problem that merits addressing? Um, I think depending on who you ask, whether arbitrators, academics, uh, investors, or states, or NGOs, the answer will be uh, there's either no problem, it's only a perception problem, or there's a fundamental problem that requires uh, that addressing because it undermines the legitimacy of the system. And that's not to suggest that there's a monolithic view amongst the different actors in the system. Uh, but let me just talk about the state's perspective for a moment. Um, and for the state, it's really crucial. And what we heard uh, in the context of Ancestral Working Group 3 is very much a generalized um, concern uh, that it's important not only to address, to ensure the uh, independence and, and impartiality of the arbitrators, but also to ensure uh, that that justice be done and that also justice appears to be done. So to, to address the perception as well. Uh, and, and those things are key. And specifically in that context, the, the issue of double hatting was uh, raised as giving rise to a concern 
that the arbitrator also had the ability to decide or to appear to decide on issues in a way that could benefit a party they represent in another dispute. And so that this was seen as, as something that needed to be regulated uh, and that there needed to be some, some clearer directions and, and standards uh, on this kind of a practice uh, on, and, and on the different roles the arbitrator could engage in. Now, what Meng said is also true. I think many states do realize that uh, their the, the, blanket prohibition or depending on the scope of the prohibition, but even a, a more narrow prohibition could have a significant impact and, and uh, effect, uh, for example, gender and regional diversity, uh, affect the freedom of the parties to choose their arbitrators, uh, result in too many academics, too many retired arbitrators, or even just more commercial arbitrators being appointed as, as a result. Um, so yeah, I think those are important parts of the discussion and we want to make sure that uh, whatever solution we address uh, really uh, focuses on, on the problem, on the lack of, uh, on the perception at least of a, of a lack of impartiality and, and where the issues have ar arisen today. So I'll just stop now and, and uh, come back later to some of the issues uh, and the solutions. Thank you. Oh, and maybe just before, maybe before I, 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 um, I, I um, give the floor to others, I, I do want to clarify that you know, certainly there has been uh, to date some efforts, as, as you mentioned, Kara, uh, in CPTPP and CETA to address this issue of double hatting. Um, and this, and in, in both those agreements, the scope of the double hatting is extends not only to the existing agreement to the investment disputes under other investment treaties. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Thank you very much. This was this was very interesting. It might be now uh, interesting to hear more. Uh, maybe Anna, if you can tell us a little more about uh, how wor the work working group three, uh, a little bit of a background, how how working group three is, is working on on this and how um, the, the the approach that it's taking in, in looking at this question and uh, and the code also more generally. The still on mute, Anna. Uh, is it okay now? Wonderful, yes. thank you very much, we can hear you. So thanks very much for giving me the floor and to echo Joe's uh, introductory remarks. Uh, we indeed had a very interesting uh, a set of comments that we got from the panelists and the floor yesterday when we discussed the topic of issue conflict and uh, we took note of uh, lots of very good suggestions, uh, for instance, uh, relating to the definition of the topic, which is one of the points that Meg was raising earlier. Uh, but instead of defining the topic that doesn't lend itself to a peer definition, rather give some examples of situations where this can arise. So I'm very grateful for, for all these comments that we uh, also look forward uh, from the, today's discussion and from today's panel. Uh, this would help us refine and amend the draft that uh, you have before you um, before it goes for discussions and deliberations by the working group. And that will take place sometime in 2021. We're not sure yet whether it will be at the spring session or whether it will be uh, later in the year. So we still have a bit of time for receiving comments. And in this regard, I wanted to, to mention that um, both ICSID and us have extended the time limit for receiving comments to end of November. So anyone who feels compelled to add uh, their, their views and their suggestions uh, that we can take them into account in the revised draft that will be submitted to the working group, it's a good idea. Um, so by way of background, and um, as was also uh, mentioned by um, all of you in the introductions for this specific provision, the working group early on in April 2018 has specifically identified the issue of double hacking as one which uh, raised concerns 
if you recall, the, the mandate of this working group was to begin by identifying concerns and then from based on these concerns, identify possible solutions and from these solutions, then narrow it down into reform options, which is what is currently being discussed. And the code of conduct was among a draft code of conduct was among the first suggestions that were made as a possible reform option. So it was really felt that was that was very uh, badly needed in the ISDS system. And uh, as to our topic of double hacking, um, the, the working group in, in April 2018 noted that some individuals act as counsel and as arbitrators in different ISDS proceedings with the possibility of ensuring um, conflicts of interest. Now, what the working group looked at were, of course, uh, statistics and, um, and information that uh, used uh, very early on this term of double hacking. If you recall, for instance, that uh, there were a number of publications where they had a hit parade of double hatters. Um, and uh, the, the working group, uh, after looking at uh, these different uh, statistics and the information available, noted that this practice was prevalent in ISDS and that it caused concerns of potential and actual conflict of interest, and that even the appearance of impropriety, and that's also a point that was made uh, by both CV and Meg, uh, this appearance of impropriety had a negative impact on the perception of legitimacy of ISDS. Now, it's important to remember um, in this regard that the issue of double hatting was one of the recurrent criticisms expressed notably by civil society against ISDS and was one of the strong arguments that was put forward by the uh, European Commission when proposing to replace ad hoc arbitration by a standing court system with full-time judges that were called adjudicators, um, and that would uh, completely replace uh, the existing uh, ad hoc arbitration system. And one of the really main reasons or the, the main criticism uh, to, be, um, to be addressed by this provision or this, this reform was precisely double hacking. And, and that double hacking or even triple hacking or, or quadruple hacking um, has really been uh, at the heart of this, these criticisms. So double hacking, uh, as you mentioned, has also been addressed in already in several recent investment treaty provisions. And when we discuss the scope of the draft provision, we will see that the approaches vary. Uh, but that they all tend to be very broad in their scope, going beyond acting as counsel and arbitrator, but also extending to individuals acting as party appointed experts in certain ISDS cases, or even advisors to third party funders, as was also mentioned during the, the working group deliberations. During the session of November 2018, when the reform option of a code of, code of conduct was further discussed and defined, the working group discussed certain issues that were identified as a possible cause of lack of independence and impartiality and of the perception thereof. There's always this element of perception, such as repeat appointments, instances of conflict of interest, and also called issue conflict, as well as the practice of individuals switching roles as arbitrators, counsel, and experts in different ISDS proceedings. And it was suggested that the draft code of conduct that you have before you, which is the, the product uh, of, the, of putting together our heads in uh, the two secretariats, um, that the draft code of conduct should be comprehensive and encompassing all issues relating to decision makers, including double heading. So again, double heading was emphasized and, and really identified as one of the issues that should be dealt with. What the working group did not decide upon, and that was emphasized by Meg in her introduction, was uh, what should be the treatment of double hacking in the code of conduct. And you will see, of course, uh, that the, the draft code for the time being proposes different formulations. Similarly, it was also acknowledged during the deliberations of the working group three session 
that there are many interconnected issues. And one of them uh, was also mentioned by Meg is that it has, of course, uh, limiting the pool of potential arbitrators and adjudicators would, um, of course, uh, be, be uh, uh, contradict the objective of um, more diversity and also allowing uh, more uh, younger, um, younger practitioners to become arbitrators. So um, that's what I, I wanted to say basically as uh, the background of uh, where the working group was before we prepared this draft that you have before you. The draft is now um, open for comments. It will be uh, notified. Um, it will be amended, uh, taking into account all the uh, uh, comments and the suggestions we receive. So therefore, we are really very much looking forward to them. But ultimately, uh, it will be the, uh, the states in the working group that will decide how they will want to deal with this, uh, these multiple roles and particularly double heading and how um, they want to treat this uh, concern in their reform options. But I should also mention uh, maybe before um, giving it uh, over to colleagues and fellow panelists is that uh, this issue of uh, double heading is one where we grappled with the difference of treatment between arbitrators and adjudicators. As you've seen, the code is a code for uh, arbitrators and adjudicators, but obviously uh, adjudicators uh, that would be members of the standing court would not be susceptible of getting into the same uh, conflict uh, situations as uh, double headers. So that's what I, I wanted to share with you in terms of uh, background and uh, give it over to my colleagues to uh, listen to their comments and their views. Thank you. Many thanks, Anna. This was a, a wonderful explanation of really what are, what are the questions and what are the um, the issues and, and where do where do these uh, issues where, where where are how does this issue come about in the work of working group three and what are, what are the concerns the concerns of states the concerns of civil society and how and what's the background I think it's interesting that you signal that it wasn't that the issue was a very important one but there wasn't a specific direction on how to uh, formulate a provision. I thought Meg, the description of uh, of the of the provision itself, with all the brackets, I thought was was incredibly helpful. And Sylvie talked a little bit about the, the state's position, the concerns. And I wonder if I can ask Lucinda now to to move us a little bit in a different and look at a different angle and look at the. Um, of, the, uh, of the expectations that maybe we have on adjudicators and the matters that are the, the problems and the importance of, of perception and how we deal with perception and the expectations that we have on adjudicators. Thank you, Lucinda. Thank you, Chiara, and thank you to the ITA, uh, to Tom and to you for this whole series and for the opportunity to participate. Uh, so as you've just heard, I've been asked to address this issue from the point of view of an adjudicator, uh, particularly someone who, who serves as an arbitrator in the ISDS context. Uh, I also serve as an arbitrator in the international commercial context and have experience as counsel and an expert witness as well. And yes, here is a confession. I have double hatted. Um, although not simultaneously in the ISDS context, but certainly sequentially. And I believe uh, fervently that my experience as counsel and as an expert has made me a better arbitrator and that we want people with significant practical experience that they can bring to bear on the resolution of these disputes. I actually think that's true for judges as well, but I think it's even more true in international arbitration and in the court setting for multiple reasons. But the question is whether multiple hatting on a concurrent basis, and I emphasize concurrent because I think sequential uh, multiple roles presents different issues in the context of ISDS is problematic. And my own view is that there is both a real issue and a perception issue Perception's already been mentioned multiple times, with the perception of the problem perhaps being greater 
than the problem itself. Now, it's interesting to look for data. Uh, there's limited data, in fact, on the extent of multiple hatting and even less data on whether it really creates a problem. Uh, but such data that there is, and I think of particular interest is a study that was done in 2017, published in the Journal of International Economic Law, seems to show that multiple hatting is relatively prevalent in a small group of individuals who are highly successful in securing both appointments as arbitrator and engagements of counsel, and who sometimes also serve as experts in ISDS cases. Uh, one could therefore argue that the problem would likely be solved or at least substantially diminished if the pool of arbitrators for these significant cases were less concentrated. But that would still leave the issue of perception. And as the saying goes, perception is reality. And in fact, uh, we operate in multiple arenas where the appearance of impropriety in the conflict uh, area and in other ethical areas is in itself a problem. Uh, I agree that no consent-based system such as ISDS can survive unless it's perceived to be legitimate. And the problem I see with double hatting, either as counsel or expert in ISDS versus arbitrator adjudicator, and I recognize there are these other roles, I I'm gonna not focus on those, but but, but double hatting either as counsel or expert versus being an arbitrator can in fact raise legitimate doubts about impartiality and independence of the arbitrator. And these are the touchstones uh, of the system as, as everyone has said. Now it's a subtle problem when you think about the counsel issue uh, or at least more subtle perhaps than the role of expert uh, who's opining on the ultimate legal issues in the case. Counsel should be understood uh, to be acting as an advocate and espousing positions that are in the client's interest. But with multiple roles, it can be really difficult to determine whether decisions are being shaded to benefit counsel's interest in serving clients' interests. And it bears emphasis as we think about the specifics of, of things like this proposed code that these are things that are not, not likely to be as easily identified as identity of the parties. They're more subtle and they're therefore harder to police. Of course, there are also mutual back scratching, revolving door situations where people go back and forth between counsel and arbitrator roles through reciprocal appointments, which actually strikes me as one of the more troubling uh, practices from a perception point of view. Um, I, I could tell stories about, about this uh, 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 that, that, that I've, I've seen from my own experience that have raised issues. Uh, so these perceptions, whether or not there's an actual conflict, uh, especially if there's a limited pool of people who are perceived to have outsized influence on the market, if you will, so it, it starts to look like a market capture situation, can in fact undermine legitimacy. And we know that in ISDS, a great deal is at stake for both parties. But the states are the ones who have to consent to have these disputes be submitted to arbitration through signing a treaty or some other instrument. And because the system at the end of the day is founded on state consent and couldn't exist without it, I think state perceptions of legitimacy do take on an outsized importance. So I remain of the view that, that much of the problem that, that exists likely results from the perception that there is a kind of club that dominates the field of play and that these players are somehow able, although it's not necessarily clear how, uh, to use their dominant position to advantage. That's right. If that's right, then enlarging the pool could in fact be an effective strategy for combating the problem, but that takes time. And in the meantime, the perception will persist potentially to the damage the system. So I somewhat reluctantly, Chiara, come to the conclusion that because perception is reality for key stakeholders in the system, there probably needs to be 
some action taken to restore legitimacy. I'll stop there and we can turn to solutions later. Thank you very much. Uh, Sandra. You really showed and uh, showed us, I mean, the complexity of perception. And I like your conclusion that perception sometimes is reality. And so something uh, has to be done. We will go in, in, in the second round of discussion. We will talk about more specifically about how um, the, the kind of the views of Article 6 and, and what might be some of the preferences. Before we go there, can I ask uh, Andrea maybe to, to pick up uh, some of the questions uh, raised? Uh, and talk a little bit about, on one side, kind of the, the possible overlap between uh, issue conflict and uh, double hatching, because some people, I mean, there, there are some, some, some links there, of course, but at the same time, the, um, the concerns about the definition of double hatching and the differences between, you know, the role of played by experts, counsel, adjudicators, a bit more broadly. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Chiara and Tom. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, uh, this morning, a morning for me anyway. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's been great to, to listen to the presentation so far, and I really enjoyed our preliminary discussions uh, on the issue as well, because it seems to me that one of the things that we're still doing in a way is circling around the idea of what exactly the problem is. I think Lucinda mentioned clubbiness and maybe a reciprocity issue. And I think that is a, you know, a potentially significant concern that really does go to legitimacy and that deserves uh, addressing. Um, it's not always clear to me though that that is the concern most articulated uh, in uh, with respect to the double hatting issue, and it arguably could arise in an issue of with people who act as arbitrator and only act as arbitrator, but nonetheless, let us say, support each other's careers in, in a way uh, that encourages mutual advancement, but they don't act as counsel, they don't act as experts. I'm not sure that that is limited to double hatting, but is perhaps in the general uh, world of, of arbitration, where the one of the reasons you're appointed is because you're known, you're respected, your expertise is respected. Um, the, so the, the second thing I would say, though, is a lot of what we talk about as the concern seems to be it seems to overlap or at least impinge upon the issue, the issue conflict idea. This idea of whether somebody can be independent and impartial, what their psychology is. Um, and Sylvie gave us a great example of uh, the arbitrator, you know, can the arbitrator um, really decide a case um, who is simultaneously acting as counsel? Can the arbitrators decide a case in a way that would be adverse to the interest of the client? Um, we could flip that around and say, and could the counsel fulfill his ethical duties to the client by deciding a case in a way that was adverse to that client. So that's a, I think that's a clear problem, but that would seem to be an issue conflict. I mean, in, in, in a fairly significant and clear way. And this also illustrates the sequential issue that Lucinda was mentioning, because in the order that Sylvie presented it, that's clear that that's a problem. The arbitrator is acting as counsel, and maybe if the, you know is is also going to issue a decision that will be uh, uh, published probably. It's interesting to me the link between transparency and some of these issues because the fact that things are published and are then used as hmm, persuasive, uh, if not actually precedential, means that what is already decided makes uh, is important. Um, yet if the arbit if the if our current counsel had acted as arbitrator a year ago or even three months ago and the decision was already out, you probably wouldn't say he couldn't be counsel in this current case because the arbitration was not uh, ongoing. Uh, but would he still have a cycle, you know, would we be worried about his psychology less so? Um, but the, the psychological issue also raises this issue about whether the double hatting concern is a proxy for uh, somebody who has already, you know, made up his mind, who is all, who is not open and independent, and that raises this question that I think Meg started us off with, which is, if that's the case, why are we really concerned about counsel 
if counsel are advocates and we understand that counsel are representing the point of view of their client, and why would we not be equally or even more concerned with experts or even academics who presumably wrote uh, an opinion <laughs> based on their best judgment about a particular issue? Are they open uh, to changing their minds or to making a different uh, decision in a particular case? And we tend not to scrutinize anyone to that level of specificity, uh, except insofar as we read their opinions and their judgments. But that, I think, is a separate uh, question uh, that should or could at least be addressed. Uh, yet then, and, and I think Lucinda touched upon this, but then we also segue into this question of expertise. Do you really want an arbitrator who knows nothing about umbrella clauses, who knows nothing about regulatory expropriation and has no idea whatsoever about either of those issues, you know, then uh, that would seem to uh, negate the expertise idea and also negate the approach taken in the CETA and some of the other agreements that actually require that kind of expertise. So I, I think I think we continue to circle around a little bit about what exactly the, the problem is, which then will lead us into what the potential solution might be. So I'll stop there and... Uh, thank you very much, Andra. This is uh, very interesting looking at the overlap and how what, what is the problem that you're trying to regulate. At the same time, Bart, can I ask you, mm -hmm. when we're thinking about regulating um, double hatting, we are thinking also of kind of limiting the party autonomy in the selection of arbitrators, which is really at the core of the investment arbitration system. And I, and I wonder if you can talk to, to us a little bit about that and whether you think uh, if these, the policy justifications for these limitations are legitimate or they outweigh some of the consequences that we're trying to, um, to, um, to protect or, or on regulating double-heading. Thank you, Bart. Thank you very much, Kara, uh, and thank you uh, to uh, the ITA for putting together this terrific panel. It's great to see so many, uh, so many friends uh, on screen. So a, a, a prohibition on double hatting would not only impact adjudicators, it would also limit the right of parties to select arbitrators who are best situated to decide a specific dispute. This would not be a fundamental change. A foundational feature of international arbitration is a party's right to participate in the selection of the arbitrators who will decide the case. In court, you don't pick the judge. In arbitration, you do. This is a fundamental difference. As counsel for both states and for investors, I devote substantial resources to selecting arbitrators who are right to decide that case. I work closely with the client to identify a profile of the ideal candidate for that particular dispute. We then together conduct a search for candidates that correspond to the profile. And every time, the end result is a very short list. There are at best two or three names that fully correspond to the profile, and once conflicts and availability are taken into account, the list becomes vanishingly small. Now I'm going to give an example that's based on a true story. The dispute in this example concerns a waste to power facility that the investors persuaded a municipality they could build. The investors promised that the facility would generate a huge amount of power, as well as disposing of all of the city's waste and earning profits. The plant was never built. The investors blamed this on a breach of the treaty by the state. The state conducted an initial case assessment. And that case assessment found that, that it was preposterous that these investors 
could construct a facility of that size and complexity. An arbitrator who understood this would swiftly grasp that the claims were baseless. The profile for the ideal arbitrator was therefore for one who, in addition to having experience with investment treaties, having the right language skills and the right gravitas in the field, also had acted in recent disputes concerning the construction of large power plants and so knew what was required to build these complex beasts with current technology. There was a small number of candidates that fit this criteria. Almost all of them acted as counsel as well as sat as arbitrators. A prohibition of double hatting would have prevented the state in this case from selecting the best arbitrator for it. As it happened, the state uh, in the case in which the example is based did make that best selection and it won the case. A prohibition of double hatting has significant consequences for party autonomy in selecting arbitrators. It also has a significant impact on diversity in arbitrator appointments, as we've already heard today. Being an arbitrator is, and always has been, traditionally a part-time job. Only a small group can do it as a full-time profession. These tend to be older and from a generation when there was less diversity in the field. Excluding those with another job as counsel will limit the field's ability to achieve the diversity among arbitrators that it greatly needs. The question that we're debating today is whether these adverse consequences are outweighed by the benefits of a prohibition. My submission is that they are not. A prohibition of double hatting makes sense for judges. Judges are historically expected to have judging as their exclusive vocation. Arbitrators are not judges. Painting them with the same brush as judges is a mistake. And finally, as we've heard, the, the main justification for a prohibition on double hatting is issue conflicts. Issue conflicts is an issue and it should be regulated, but it should be regulated separately and separately mm -hmm. for arbitrators and for judges. And with that, I will uh, stop and hand the floor back to you, Kara. Thank you very much, Bart. Um, I will take over as moderator for the next set of questions. Um, thank you, everyone, for your very thoughtful presentations. We've talked about, you know, what is the nature um, of the double heading issue and is it a problem? Um, and now I think we should turn our attention to um, how should the problem be addressed? Obviously, Article 6 um, is um, still a draft that allows many different options and many different approaches as to possible solutions. Um, so maybe starting with Sylvie, um, you know, of the different options uh, included in the draft, what would you think would be the most appropriate approach towards um, addressing impossible regulation? You're muted, Sylvie. Uh, sorry. Um, let me just uh, pick up on, start by picking up on some of the points that uh, have been made uh, by Bart and by Andrea. Um, and just to mention that 
what we're seeing is some of the discussion we're having about the problems and the solutions are very much linked to the changing nature of investment arbitration. And whereas the original exit drafters, uh, the, the drafters of the exit convention may have foreseen uh, contract-based commercial arbitration uh, and the system was appropriate for that, we're seeing many more pub, uh, challenges to legislation and uh, the public nature of the cases very much points to something that uh, does impose greater ethical duties on arbitrators. And um, I think none of us, uh, all of us would be very horrified to have judges uh, also acting as counsel in our domestic legal systems. So uh, maybe this points to something similar in the investment arbitration context, given the, the, the nature of the cases uh, that they're hearing. Um, so that's the first comment I wanted to make. And then moving to the solutions, um, as, as I mentioned at the outset, I think Canada is party to two recent treaties uh, where we have uh, included prohibitions on double hatting, uh, where uh, that are limited uh, to concurrent, uh, concurrently acting as investment counsel, uh, as counsel in investment arbitration, as well as arbitrator uh, under the CPTPP and CETA, so under those treaties and other investment agreements. Uh, and uh, then I think there, there, this is a, a good starting point. Um, certainly, I think disclosure can uh, assist. So for example, uh, for existing appointments, uh, the arbitrator, the candidate being considered for uh, arbitrator, uh, can disclose uh, the pr um, previous or ongoing mandates that they have as counsel, and the parties could decide potentially to uh, waive or to uh, choose uh, that candidate as arbitrator. Uh, so it's possible that there is a little bit of flexibility around that. Uh, the, the disputing parties would know uh, what the existing mandates are and can make an informed choice. That being said, I think um, there could potentially uh, be uh, later on a conflict may arise. Uh, some of the issues may become clearer later. Uh, the issue conflict or uh, could arise at a later stage in the arbitration. Uh, and therefore, it could not be the most efficient way of proceeding. But uh, there is potentially um, for ongoing mandates or previous mandates, disclosure may be something uh, sufficient to consider. I think the issue is different with respect to future mandates. Uh, and uh, in my experience, uh, disclosure will probably not be sufficient. Uh, once the arbitrator is appointed, it becomes very difficult for counsel uh, to object to the arbitrator's role in another dispute. Uh, or, uh, and more worrying, um, I think it just leads to more challenges. Uh, challenges of arbitrators is uncertain. Uh, there's no real guidance uh, on incompatible roles, and I don't know how we could come up with some. Um, and so challenges are risky, and even if they're successful, they will result in additional cost and additional time. Uh, and this becomes really problematic when the arbitration is, is well advanced. Um, and so while I, I completely agree with all of the comments that have been made about uh, finding a solution uh, that properly balances any unintended effects, uh, including diversity. Um, I, I think that the prohibition has the advantage uh, of clarity and avoiding these unnecess unnecessary and costly challenges. Um, now, um, there's, with respect to scope, I, I did mention that I don't think it should go uh, beyond uh, uh, other investment agreements, uh, but it certainly uh, should go beyond the same treaty because uh, the, the issues that are disputed in uh, these investment cases are usually very limited. It's the same kinds of obligations uh, and the same types of issues that arise. And so just limited, limiting it to the same treaty would certainly not address the issue uh, or, or the same parties. Um, now, there may be, in addition to uh, setting the scope, uh, the prohibition to, the, to all investment agreements, 
there may be other issues that arise, issue conflict uh, that could be addressed differently. For example, if the, the same facts arise, but I, I think that's a bit of a, of a different issue. And really um, it is, the, the problem has been very much focused on uh, arbitrator acting as counsel or, and uh, to a lesser extent, also arbitrator acting as uh, expert. Um, and in terms of temporal limits, um, as I said, uh, probably not a problem that they acted in, as counsel before being arbitrators uh, and potentially there's a, a bit of a ongoing mandates that could be allowed, but certainly um, the, the, there is a, an important and more difficult issue with respect to how long do you extend the prohibition uh, does it extend in time beyond um, the, the the one of the appointment as arbitrator, um, and that's a little bit more difficult uh, because, as as uh, so, uh, the comments that were made earlier, some of the appointments, some arbitrators only get a few appointments. So maybe in conclusion, um, I think there are certainly some difficulties that arise out of a prohibition and maybe it does uh, highlight some of the advantage of considering a, a more permanent mechanism where uh, the arbitrators will be uh, full-time employees and remunerated as such and therefore uh, will not have to uh, engage in additional roles uh, that raise those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvie, for your thoughtful comments. Um, so uh, we've heard the concerns about um, the um, adverse impact to a, a, a diversity of, of the arbitrator pool and to broadening the pool, which has been quite concentrated. Um, and some people have actually suggested that there be a transitional phase uh, mm -hmm. in order to mitigate some of those impacts. In light of all of that, Andrea, how would you um, uh, revise Article 6, uh, what would be the best way to regulate the issues that we've discussed uh, from your perspective? Oh, Tom, I don't think I really have an answer to that. If I did, I'd happily uh, share it with you. Uh, but but uh, the, I think Bart has already mentioned this, his view that judges should be treated differently from arbitrators. And maybe that is the transition and that Sylvie's alluding to as well, the, the a transition from, well, we assume, let, let's assume that we, we have three, well, let's assume we have existing ISDS, we have the investment court system under CETA, which is a little bit of a hybrid model because the judges would not be permanent, they'd not be full time, and then maybe one day you have a, a multilateral investment court or a MIC where you had permanent judges. And maybe the rules for those three bodies should be slightly different, um, keeping in mind the, the difference in the roles and the, the different expectations around permanent remuneration and permanent, uh, permanent uh, uh, employment. But the, um, it, it seems to me that for existing ISDS, if you're going to uh, try to alleviate some of the problems without overly limiting the pool that you would want some kind of, you'd probably try to regulate it with disclosure so that you wouldn't preclude movement into the arbitral sphere um, or require an absolute jump in with both feet into, into the role of arbitrator um, whereas for, you know, I think the harder issue, you know, maybe for the um, MIC, you know, easier permanent employment, I think for the CETA, it's a little bit harder, right? For the idea that you're named to a roster, you have a retainer, but you're not, you're not allowed to act as counsel or as expert. One of the issues there is whether you can act as arbitrator in other cases, because that's not precluded by the CETA, although you're not supposed to act in a way that jeopardizes your independence or impartiality. So there we have the possibility of, you know, you're, you're a CETA judge, we'll call it a judge, but you're a CETA judge, and then you're appointed by a law firm in a non-CETA case, 
And then a year later, that law firm brings a case in front of CETA. What do you do? do you, are you just recused from that? Would that be a problem? I, given in, in my hypothetical, you've never gotten a CETA case. There's never been a case. You're not being paid to be a CETA arbitrator. You're being paid a small amount, a relatively small amount. I, I, I try not to say that to my students. Some of them are on this call, I think, but a relatively small amount to, uh, to uh, keep yourself available, but it's not enough to replace your, the income that you've lost. So, and in, insofar as transitions are concerned too, I think we should think about I don't know, a larger ethical issue. And some of you know these cases, as we know, uh, many of us only too well, uh, Tom, <laughs> these cases can drag on for a long time. And do you really, and you know, if you've got somebody counsel, she's been counsel for eight years, hearing is finally, <laughs> hearing on quantum, finally coming up, you know, in three months, and now she's got her first appointment. Do you want her to have to give up her role as counsel when arguably that is not really consistent with the highest ethical obligations, yet maybe it would be nice for her to seize her opportunity to be an arbitrator. And so should there, so I think Sylvie mentioned this, I think maybe treating existing appointments might be a, a beneficial and then uh, uh, maybe prohibit, prohibiting new mandates, although again, that could still be prohibitive if you don't have new, if you don't have new arbitral mandates, you might still be uh, in poor financial shape if your gamble does not pay off, but that might be a, a trade-off. So I'll just stop there because I don't want to take too much time. Thank you very much, Andrea. Lucinda, you talked about um, the issue being in large part an issue of perception rather than an actual um, independence or impartiality conflict. What are your views with respect to how you think it ought to be addressed? Thank you, Tom. Well, for the reasons I'll explain, I would be very cautious at this stage about going too far uh, to fix the problem uh, in the ad hoc context. Uh, I think a permanent investment court raises different issues and there I do think a ban on concurrent roles is wholly appropriate and there probably also needs to be a cooling off period uh, for, for, for people who leave the court and want to take up the council role again, at least in terms of appearing before the court on which they served. Um, that's a typical revolving door kind of restriction, but, but that's, that's not for the ad hoc. I would start by saying, Tom, that as a general matter, I strongly believe in the values of transparency and disclosure mechanism. That is providing people with information so that they can make an informed choice. And as an arbitrator, I try personally to err on the side of more rather than less disclosure. And I think this approach for the reasons Bart has articulated is particularly important in a system that's based on party autonomy. Uh, including as to the choice of arbitrator. The challenge with the disclosure approach is, is that you need full disclosure of the necessary information, which as Sylvie's pointed out, can, can, can be difficult at any stage, but particularly as, as the proceedings advance. Um, and so if the arbitrator believes that he or she shouldn't resign, is still impartial and independent, despite whatever concerns have been raised, then the tool that exists to deal with this situation uh, is the challenge mechanism. And this mechanism is uh, costly for the parties, disruptive, and in systems where it falls to the co-arbitrators to decide, uh, may simply feed into the perception problem that you've got club members not being uh, in a position where they can effectively police each other. So frankly, an effective disclosure approach, which I would a priori favor, may well require a better mechanism to resolve issues, perhaps an independent mechanism that could decide quickly. And, and that might also bring greater consistency and help deal with perception issues. But you would still have you know, the, some of the problems that Sylvie has pointed out uh, particularly with issues that arise during the course of proceedings. 
So, but although a ban has the virtue of simplicity, I'm really concerned about a ban. Uh, not only because of the, the barriers to entry, the diversity, the potential impact on the quality of the pool, the expertise issues, but also because of the challenges we've had here today in really pinning down the problem uh, uh, beyond stating that there may, there's a perception issue. But with perception problems, there's really a heightened risk that the solution is going to be more extreme than is really justified. And that will only increase the unintended and adverse consequences. So let's, let's hypothesize for a moment that perhaps the real problem of multiple roles, multiple hatting, is the concentration of power uh, in the system in a small group of people. Um, and, and then why not have a limiting role barring multiple hats that only kicks in when someone reaches that position of outside influence, which would have to be measured by the number of arbitral appointments that they have. Now, this idea is similar to a proposal made by Anthea Roberts a couple of years back uh, for a transitional rule that, that was, uh, would allow people trying to break into the system to double hat up to a certain point. But it starts from a different point of analytic departure, which is you know, the concentration issue. Uh, but nevertheless, the two may converge to some extent, and it could be helpful uh, for people trying to break into the system. Uh, but with this approach, uh, the threshold for banning multiple hatting would probably be a bit higher than her proposal of five appointments, because I don't think that number is as significant to the system today. Uh, uh, in terms of concentration of influence as it was when there were only a few cases every year. And if you did that, that would still leave a need for some greater guidance uh, to be given to potential arbitrators who were below the threshold about steps they should take to avoid and minimize perception risk. Now, I would submit that guidance is effective in this area. Uh, I would. I, I don't think anyone's done a, a, a hard survey of the influence that the IBA guidance on conflicts of interest has had, but I can say anecdotally that it does. The red list, for example, does influence people. And so why not take a stab at trying to expand that uh, through some guidance that would really try to highlight what, what the real problems here are. I don't think it's party identity. I think the issue conflict area, you can identify problems, but it's immensely tricky. Uh, what's factual overlap? I, I think these areas are really hard. There may be different levels of tolerance, even though all arbitrators in the system about have duties of impartiality and independence. Uh, you know, there, there, there may be different levels of tolerance that people bring to the table for uh, a party appointed arbitrator versus a president. Um, so so uh, I, I think there really needs to be some more thought given to this and there may need to be improvement in the challenge mechanisms and the availability of information. So those are some thoughts for consideration. Uh, and, and as I said at the outset, I'd really uh, approach the issue of solutions here with caution and think about perhaps something incremental until we have our ground a little firmer under us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucinda. You know, Bart, you talked about the adverse impact on expertise. Um, and of course, you know, one of the great uh, aspects and benefits of arbitration is that we get to have the benefit of experts, people who are really appropriate and informed um, to decide our disputes query uh, for you whether the way to regulate would be by way of disclosure rather than prohibition, but to uh, pick up on some of what Lucinda just said, perhaps enhance the guidance with respect to issue conflicts um, and independence and provide some guidance as to when challenges should be entertained and, uh, and sustained. Over to you. Uh, Tom, Tom, thank you. I, I think that's exactly the right way to go with the slight nuance that I think we need to take a different approach for judges 
than for arbitrators. Uh, for judges, uh, a complete prohibition on double hatting would accord best with what is expected from real judges by the public. And uh, I, I've listened with great interest to the comments that, that Andrea made about uh, the, the nature of those given the title of judge under some treaties <laughs> and perhaps a, a line of work for the code of conduct might be to take up the hard task of defining what really is a judge <laughs> as opposed to someone who's been given that title for political reasons more than functional reasons. But assuming that we're talking about a real judge, someone who is a full-time member of a permanent tribunal, then it seems to me that a prohibition of double heading is, is the appropriate approach. Conversely, for issue conflict, a more nuanced approach should, in my view, be taken for judges. It should not be a conflict that a judge, sitting as a judge, has already decided a case that involved expropriation. That's not the way that it works in any system of administration of justice, and it shouldn't be the way that it works on a real investment court. So there, there's a, a kind of a parallelism here where the relationship between double hatting and issue conflict um, mirrors it, each other, perhaps, uh, in, in one approach. Disclosure does strike me as the right approach for arbitrators. Dis full disclosure gives the parties the tools they need to mount a challenge if there really is a serious concern about an impact on the fairness of the process. And you know, let's go back to basics for a moment. The purpose of a code of conduct should be to ensure the fairness of the process, to ensure that the decision makers really are independent of the parties and impartial. And if double hatting gives rise to a situation that does affect the fairness of the process, a party should be able to articulate that in a way that is compelling to the appointing authority and allows that appointing authority to understand that this is something that must be addressed. And of course, as part of the guidance for the application of independence and impartiality requirements as to issue conflicts, uh, more sharpness can be given to these issues. But disclosure, I think, is the right approach for arbitrators rather than a prohibition of double heading and if that disclosure produces the grist for a serious challenge, then we have the tools already to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bart. Anna, you've, you've heard the, the debate between disclosure and, um, and uh, some level of banning. So any, any parting thoughts from you based on what you've heard? Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, and, and thank you all for sharing uh, these interesting views. And um, um, I think what if I, I have two two points I would like to make as um, as a takeaway for me and for for the work we are going to do in in uh, in uh, amending or adjusting the code. I think um, I take very clearly away that double having an issues conflict is not the same thing and we should not put that into the same basket. Uh, if we do that, we, we are already not addressing uh, one or not addressing the other. And I think that we've seen that yesterday, it's even clearer now, the fact that we have it in two different provisions of the code seems to me to be the best way to address these things that are inherently different. Um, and the second point I wanted to make is that um, um, Lucinda's point about perception is, is I think, 
key in the sense that uh, may, you may think that it's for all the wrong reasons, but um, the criticism of ISDS has really crystallized around double capping. And uh, if it's not, if there is no clear um, and strong measure uh, in the code of conduct to address double heading, um, it will fail to, to address the, the concern that was raised and it will make the case for completely getting rid of arbitration even stronger. And I think that this is something that uh, those who are suggesting that um, you know there may still be some uh, doubts about whether this is really a problem and whether it's identified in the right way etc uh, i think it, it really it's really something to be thought about because at the end of the day something is going to come out on double heading and um it it will have to address the problem it will have to make sure that this red flag that goes up as soon as you say ISDS uh, and the Singas point about the club, um, all of these, these uh, all of these issues, of course, are, are very intricately uh, interlinked. But I think they, the the answer that that the code will have to provide um, will have to be very very clear and very strong. And in that sense, uh, once again, I think that the, the suggestion that was made that guidance is, is needed and can be very useful uh, is something that we will have to think about, and not only guidance about uh, possible issues where double heading da, 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 could, could uh, be of a, a, a problem, but also how to guide um, aspiring arbitrators or you know those who would like to to make the transition to to how to to do that in the best possible way that's what i take away and thanks again for those taking notes because this is immensely helpful um because I, I i may have been a double header for a long time but i'm not a double brainer so i cannot concentrate and take notes and think uh, at the same time so Thanks for the colleagues who take the notes. Thank you very much, Anna. Meg, over to you for some final reflections on uh, on what you've heard today and possible future approaches. Yeah, a, a number of things. Um, first of all, I think it's worth us trying to do a bit more empirical work to say how prevalent is the problem. My sense is there is much less devil heading now, and it may well be in some respects, generational. That doesn't mean you don't want to address it, but I think that's a relevant input to your considerations. Um, secondly, uh, what I heard yesterday and today and what I've heard frequently, and I'm totally in agreement with it, although it's very hard, is that we need to make sure there is much more specificity in this code, much more concrete. If you do this, it's a problem. And that can be very difficult because so much of this is fact dependent. But I think that's, uh, that's a lot of what we are frequently hearing. Uh, and we're going to have to work that in somehow as we go into another draft. Um, and the third thing, which again is, is more philosophical, but this whole difference between the role of a judge and what you should expect with arbitration is a key one. And sometimes I think we are putting them all together. And uh, that gives us sort of a, a result that might work for one part of the equation, but not the other. So keeping in mind, arbitration brings certain things, maybe good, maybe bad, but it is different than a court model. And can you regulate the same way? So those would be my sort of takeaways from today. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, Meg. I think we're about uh, out of time, uh, Chiara. Um, I know there was, a, there was a question on whether or not if we mandated disclosure rather than a prohibition under Article 6, would that disclosure be effectively uh, duplicative of the disclosure of all prior cases under Article 5, Section 2, Sub C? Uh, I think that's probably a, a valid point that uh, these disclosures um, would be quite similar. Does, uh, does anyone have a view? 
Meg, you're, you're on mute, but please. I think they, they were meant to be mutually reinforcing. So I don't think it's a different disclosure under Article 6 than necessarily under 5.2. They complement each other. If you made that 5.2 disclosure, you probably disclosed for the purposes of Article 6. And I think that was what was intended. Chiara, any, any other final comments or thoughts? Now, just to, to thank uh, all our panelists, uh, one just issue for, for reflection that I see in the commentary, but I don't think we have time to address it, is whether unilateral appointment of arbitrators are a fundamental right of the parties. I think this is an interesting question and, um, and, and it is related to a fundamental, uh, or, or could it be related to a fundamental rule of procedure? This is more for reflection for us. Um, as a reminder to, uh, to our audience, we are, uh, are going to be he here tomorrow, uh, uh, Tom and I and another um, set of, of, of panelists talking about multiple appointments and then on, um, on Friday issue of, of implementation and enforcement. So this is very much a, a, a long term discussion and something that we, uh, we are keen to, um, to build on uh, and, and continue the discussion. So for the moment, because the time is up, I just want to thank um, everybody. This is, I think, is a very rich and thoughtful discussion. Um, thank you very much all for, uh, for coming and uh, um, to continue this discussion and hopefully also see uh, continue the discussion tomorrow and Friday all together. Thank you. Thank you very, very much to our distinguished panel and thank you to the audience for joining us. Until tomorrow.